Okay, so here we are. Welcome to episode 27 of Mutations Podcasts, and I am pleased to be joined by Henry Andrews. And Henry is a self-taught Gravesian theorist whose interests include examining the theory with a critical eye, uh, searching for applications beyond those popularized through spiral dynamics, and you are currently developing an embodied conversational ritual based on Gravesian patterns and other concepts. Um, this present, uh, just in terms of us talking to, to, together today, we wanted to kind of begin with something you're developing right now called hella metamodernism. And so you've also been very involved in the metamodern circles and discussion spaces. So uh, why don't we kind of segue into what exactly hella metamodernism is, and, and maybe you can give the listeners a sense of how that's related to Nordic metamodernism and all the other metamodernisms that are floating around. Indeed, indeed. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks for having me here. So yeah, um, hella metamodernism. Uh, it started as a joke um, <laughs> when I was, I uh, you know, there had been this hella meta meme joke that was from an art project that had nothing to do with all of this actually that I, I did with some friends a while back. Um, but since it fit with meta modernism and meta memes, I joked about hella meta meme a couple of times. Um, and then I made this, I was talking with someone about hella mod, about metamodernism and I just impulsively made this, hella metamodernism is the California school of metamodernism. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, there's the thing about Californians saying hella a lot. Because uh, it's just hella metamodernism, it's got a great ring to it and it, 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 it sounded funny. And then I started typing up some comments of like, oh, it does this and it does this. And then I was like, oh wait, this is a thing. Uh, okay. I guess I should like actually develop this because it actually feels like a real thing. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm keeping the name Hella Metamodernism because it's difficult to say with a straight face. Uh, and I really like that. I think that we all get a little too caught up in our own seriousness a lot of the time. Uh, so something that, that, you know, makes us smile to even talk about it is, uh, is, is pretty amusing to me. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how it started and the things that have emerged there. Uh, and I really do feel like I'm discovering and naming something and that that's what I want to be doing rather than like trying to construct something, uh, if that makes sense. Like I'm not trying to assert that this is a thing that needs to be out there. I'm trying to recognize something here that if we recognize it, we can work with it and make use of it more effectively of whatever's going on. Um, so yeah, I mean, the key thing here is that, you know, the, the Nordic school is like the political and developmental school of metamodernism with Hansi Freinacht. And then the Dutch school is the, is the um, you know, using these terms Brent Cooper, I think came up with, uh, is, is, is using these, uh, uh, is, is doing the cultural and artistic and architecture sort of description of what's going on. And they were very much about what's emerging in arts and culture. So, so they're very descriptive and the, the Nordic school is more activist and prescriptive. So I'm kind of trying to split the difference a little bit. And the core concept is experiential. Like this, this view I want to take is about experience. It's about experiencing things with others and the power of shared experience. Um, so that uh, is, is focusing on something a little more active and animate than just observing the, what other, what, what's coming out of the, the art and culture and architecture. Um, but it's a little less of a push than political activism and trying to create a new politics. Uh, instead, I, I really want to tap into what are we experiencing in this time, in this cultural moment that we're, we're going through right now? Uh, how can we experience things together in a way that takes us to a better place culturally and, and, and personally? Uh, and then there are various things that kind of fall from that and various things that I'm kind of relying on, like Norbates and Zephanopoiesis. Um, uh, that are related to that. But fundamentally, I want it to be the experiential school of metamodernism. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, uh, what makes it the California school? Is, is it merely based on location in terms of where you're located and kind of tuning in into the conversation from? Or are there something uniquely Californian, perhaps, about about hella metamodernism? I mean, there's, there's 
partially it's because yeah, I'm in San Francisco and 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 that's kind of where the hella meta joke came from in the first place. Um, so that's partial and and the fact that we call these things the Nordic and Dutch schools um, based on where the people who who put them out are. Uh, so it's it's partially that. It's also relevant in the sense that it draws a lot on um, the local San Francisco Bay Area um, interactive and immersive art scene. Uh, there's really been an experiential art underground, I guess, uh, here for the last several decades. Um, it's something that I've been very involved in for the last, I guess, seven years now, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and and that is a thing, that is another major, major influence on how I am looking at this. Like the fact that that has been the emerging art form here, um, you know, where that's that's been kind of where I feel the, the cultural energy here in the Bay Area. Uh, I think that it is a metamodern art form, or, or at least it can be. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it is about creating these actual, you know, deep and in some sense sincere shared experiences, but often through a lot of ironic um, surface in terms of how we're playing with things and like what the what the story setup is or what the characters are like. Like a, a lot of that draws on on language of irony and not taking ourselves too seriously. And yet it is also sincere and you get into that sincere irony aspect of, of metamodernism. So, so yeah, um, uh, I, yeah, that's kind of the, the other thing that really grounds it in California. Um, yeah. And my friend wrote a, wrote a book on that. Can I, can I shamelessly promote Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is probably at Magister's, whoops, it's all mirrored. Um, turn your life into art lessons in psycho magic from the San Francisco underground. Uh, I'm quoted in it. I show up in the background of another story. So there's, there's some self-promotion there. Um, but it it um, it's it's the easiest way to kind of get a handle of what I mean by all of that. Um, Are there uh, maybe some some illustrations or examples either from that book or or concrete examples you might want to to share to sort of illustrate this this sort of California feeling that sort of you're you're describing but also prescribing. I, I really like the sort of straddling between the sort of system poet and meta theory approach, as you're yeah. saying, like descriptive Nordic, uh, de yeah, descriptive Nordic school, or um, what do you call it, a Dutch school, and then, um, and, and vice versa. So like, you're, it's kind of in between there. But I think some kind of illustration or example would be very yeah. interesting to hear. Yeah, so I have mostly worked as part of a group called the Mystic Midway, uh, led by Scott Levkoff, and behind the scenes, and also performer Marty Kaplan. Um, uh, there's actually a video of of them giving a talk at UX Week 2016 that you can find on Vimeo. Um, we can put a link somewhere uh, for that, that that talks about how this all works and, and shows some slides uh, because we ended up doing the opening night party for that conference. Uh, and it went, went really well. So what happens in the Mystic Midway, in a Mystic Midway event, is there's some space, uh, and it's been everything from like part of a larger event like the Edwardian Ball that happens here every year, you know, before COVID, um, where there's a lot of different art and other things going on, a lot of people wandering around in costumes. Uh, or sometimes we do it as more of a standalone thing. When we did that for the UX Week conference, it was in a... Um, food truck food court uh <laughs> over, over over near near kind of one of the cultural bar district areas uh, and we we had just set up in there and we kind of take that over in the evening and what happens is there'll be a bunch of characters wandering around the space um and the characters will and you'll interact with the characters and they'll ask you to do different things and they'll offer you something called story currency so it's we've usually printed up something that looks it's recognizably currency, but it's also recognizably not real currency. Um, the Edwardian ball one is very elaborate. And we had one when we were doing the food court. It was more of a like really brightly colored video game look. Um, so people, even if we haven't explained it to them, people understand money as a script. Like they know that they're supposed to want to get the money. So if you if you just if you're a character and you hold up money, they want to know how to get it. Like you don't have to explain to them that. So then you ask them for like 
some little bit of a story or something to do. So we have whimsical, magical, and terrible characters. And whimsical characters will ask you to like do a make up a dance on the spot. Um, a magical character might ask you about what was the last time you felt magic in nature, for example. Um, and then a terrible character, and I usually play one of these, might ask you about a failure um, or a fear. Actually, this is this is the hat of the goblin who rewards failure. It's a failure of a hat because um, I stood up in the green room, which was a school bus, and smushed it against the ceiling and decided it fit the character. So you just get asked something like about a failure, and depending on like the um, depending on the um, what kind of audience it is, we'll we might make that a very light question, like give me one word about your failure. So people aren't like, oh my god, what are you asking me for? You know, on the other hand, if we're doing this at Burning Man, we'll go like all in because people are there to have deep, crazy experiences. So, you know, we'll we'll just ask that open ended and see where it goes. And it's amazing because people will tell you things. People are waiting for this chance to say something more significant. Um, to share more of themselves. And something that's really important and really ties into other aspects of Hella Metamodernism is you'll have people going through together and they're interacting with the characters side by side so they witness each other. Um, and Scott talks about this in that, that presentation that I, I mentioned. So they'll, they'll witness each other and they'll, they'll experience what each other have to share. Um, and that can be a really powerful thing. I mean, I've had... Even in a corporate gig, I've had people come back when I was playing Mr. Nobody Who Eats Fears, and he's got a big skull, like it's literally a huge plastic skull. It's got a hinged jaw so you can make it eat fears. Uh, come back with like a fear they really needed to tell Mr. Nobody um, that they didn't, they didn't do it before, but they were like, no, I have to go tell this random guy in a skull this deep fear that I'm feeling, and I'll make a ceremony of, of eating the fear, and, you know, they'll tell me that it helped. Um, and that's so powerful, right? It's it's something that people aren't even necessarily expecting to see. Um, like I said, this this can happen even in a corporate gig where, again, that would be one where we're not trying to dive super deep because we don't want to freak people out with their coworkers. <laughs> you know, usually we'll ask the whole, there'll be like a team that comes through and we'll just, anyone on the team can answer the question. Everybody doesn't have to answer the question. You know, so it's, there's a lot of like making sure that this is, a consensual play and if someone doesn't want to play they don't have to play because if you have to play it's not play um so so yeah these this is the kind of experience that this 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 prompt this inquiry this permission allows to happen and and the last point i'll make on this before we're pausing like it's really important and i've seen this through several different things um uh not just the the mystic midway um it's really important that it's an open-ended prompt and that people have the freedom to take that where they want to go because then they'll take it to the place they need to go and it might not be what you expected if you try to if you try to put more walls on it yeah yeah that's that's really interesting i am um, i i'm kind of delighted that we're going in this direction and, and talking about this right off the bat because um part of our mutual navigation through this space has been um uh, navigating a lot of different thinkers who are talking about systems change or social transformation or social evolution, right? And a lot of these theories and approaches and communities are basing that social change off of these very abstract categorical maps about, you know, mm -hmm. moving to different historical epochs. And, and we're all kind of as our, as uh, you know, some of the context uh, you spoke at the Gebser society and talked about Claire Graves, who, um, went on to influence spiral dynamics, of course, and integral theory. Uh, so, so that's certainly kind of part of our, 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 our cultural context. And here you're having a conversation about so many interesting layers here about permission to bring out these different aspects of the psyche through these kind of performative persona that's ironic and sincere and playful. And it, it has that meta modern context, but it's being illustrated just by, you know, what's going on in culture. Like, how are you performing this? How is this sort of a, how can this be artistically and creatively expressed in culture? While we're also talking about maybe, we're also talking about something descriptive about social transformation or an evolving sensibility in culture that we can kind of descriptively map. Um, so I'm really kind of interested in, 
kind of as, as we segue into some of the other the other themes here, um, some of these tensions, right? Like, and maybe you can speak a little bit to these tensions that you've brought up online before. Um, if, if you feel okay with talking about that whole Daniel Schmachtenberger exchange, but as, <laughs> as an illustrative context, speaking of illustrative like examples, things that just happen right in our, in our yeah, kind of yeah, no, exchange, right. it's sort of interesting, yeah. It, it is, I mean, on the whole, it was actually rather delightful. Um, so yeah, what happened is Scout Leader Wiley posted a quote of Daniel Schmachtenberger's. And now I can't actually remember exactly what it was. It might've been something like emergence is the closest thing to magic allowed by science or that will, that will recognize something like that. And I went to, I went to heart it. And then I saw that it was a quote from Daniel Schmachtenberger and, and some friends of mine and I who talk about all these, these sorts of things a lot, like there's, because Schmachtenberger is ubiquitous in the sense-making scene and, and uh, you know, to some degree, like, I agree with a lot of what he says, but as got mentioned in this thread, you know, to some degree, I feel like, like when people come like, oh, you have to see this thing, I, I end up feeling like it's a little overhyped. You know, I go and watch it, I'm like, okay, that's fine, but I don't know why it was such a big, big deal. Um, so, so I made the joke in the, in a comment, like, Oh, I really want to heart this, but I'm allergic to Daniel Schmachtenberger. Um, and Scott was like, "Oh, really? Interesting. Why?" Which she does. She'll turn. She'll turn around and 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 ask me something serious about some dumbass joke I made. And I'm like, "Oh, I gotta answer this now." So I, I I said basically what what I just said here. And someone's like, "Hey, I think he's really important because he's an entry point for you know people like me who've come in." And this led to an actual good conversation on Facebook. It still <laughs> happens. Um, you know, where, where I was like, yeah, it's, you know, I don't, I don't think he's horrible. I don't think you're an idiot for liking what he has to say. Um, you know, just because I'm not super into the guy's content doesn't mean that I, you know, I think all these horrible things, um, you know, it's just, it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's not blowing me away the same, the same way it seems to be others. And I, I feel like, you know, the vitality is somewhere, somewhere else. So then Daniel Schmachtenberger shows up. <laughs> And, and is actually quite gracious about it um, uh, and asked the question of, so, you know, what do you think a healthy, um, a healthy uh, community around a, a public figure looks like versus an unhealthy community? Because we kind of touched on that earlier. And the next morning, because by that by the time he actually showed up and commented, I was too tired. I was like, I'm not doing this now. The next morning I talked about how um, I wrote about the difference between people talking about a figure and about their ideas. And if you engage with that, you talk mostly about the ideas. And yeah, of course, about the, the person who said them because there's context and that's relevant, but you're mainly able to talk about the ideas and is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? So, you know, I could probably have a conversation with that guy who was like, oh, I think Schmachtenberger is actually important. And we could probably talk about which ideas he thinks are important. And we could probably find some ideas that he's like, yeah, I'm not even that into that and it would be okay. On the other hand, and I did not mention this dread name because I did not want to attract the conversation that it always does. If you talk to many people about Jordan Peterson, you are only really allowed to talk about whether Jordan Peterson is a great man or not. I mean, everything folds back into the question of, of like, well, but why are you, you hate him because you're this and he's that. And like, you can't, you can't get away from that vortex of, of, of obsession right mm -hmm. so um and it's it's it becomes a very dissociated online fight and yeah so this might have wandered a bit far away from from where you wanted to go with that but um that's kind of like kind of where it ended up is this actual positive exchange and daniel thanked me for that answer of um you know said it said it was useful uh around that you know question of 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 health there so yeah, like I, I don't, you know, I do feel that there's something interesting in why a lot of people find Schmachtenberger compelling versus others of us don't. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's kind of what I'm trying to um, hone in on my, myself and, and sort of feeling into that because uh, I've just noticed a lot of your reactions in, in our circles tend to be yeah. of a similar kind to my own reactions in terms of being sent like being constantly sent 
John Verveke videos. And again, yeah. nothing personally against any of these individuals. Um, they mostly I, have interesting ideas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but just the kind of hype that that seems to constellate or, or surround or, or the aura of hype that seems to surround these yeah. individuals. And then why, like, that's one thing. And then the other layer is kind of our own sort of dissonance with that, like, mm -hmm. yeah, not my cup of tea. Well, why isn't it our cup of tea, you know? Yeah. And maybe we have different reasons for that, but I kind of was looking forward to just exploring that with you in terms of like, is it, is it, um, now, like what I threw in, in, in my notes to you was, is this, is it because of this sort of overemphasis on like game theory and tech yeah. discussions and tech solutions and, and sense making kind of as a re reified sort of narrative or construction, right? Right. Is there a kind of fetishization of, of a, a particular style of thinking that just rubs us the wrong way? Because maybe you and I are more on the kind of artistic, creative, um, um, you know, what's going on sort of spontaneously in culture rather than kind of here's a, a way or a style of thinking that we can apply to culture to make sense of yeah. it, right? Like uh, there's something in here that I think is, is important to kind of tease out. There is, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and it's interesting because I, I don't remember if this has ever actually come up before, but my actual professional background is as a software engineer. So, you know, you, you know, I have a 20 plus year career in software. Okay, yeah, I, I don't think that's come up before in, in our yeah, context so of conversation. I mean, that, so. that, that was my degree. I moved out to, to Silicon Valley in 1997 during the first dot com era. And I mean, I'm kind of trying to run away from that career, having kind of burnt myself out on tech. Um, uh, but um, but no, that's actually my background. So, you know, on the one hand, you'd think that I'd be all into this tech centered conversation, but actually I'm I'm kind of burnt out on that, um, which is why I kind of ran off and joined the Mystic Midway when I <laughs> had the opportunity to do so. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. And I think, I think it, it does get into the, the sense making aspect. Um, I mean, I, I have at this point kind of an impulse of just stop making sense, like stop trying to make sense. The world doesn't actually make sense. We should just deal with that. Like, engage with it. Um, so kind of the more people try to, to get control over what's going on in the world by through this, this, this concept of sense making and like convince themselves that they understand what's going on in the world. Like the more I have a bit of a reaction against, or I'm like, oh, okay, I, I don't think that's how that, how things really work anymore. Um, right. I mean, we have been through, if we want to talk about the historical sweep, we've been through the enlightenment and the age of reason and rational empiricism. And I was on Twitter the other day, which I don't usually do, but have been convinced to check on every once in a while recently. Um, and, uh, someone had a tweet of what does believe in, what does believe science, believe in science even mean? <laughs> And, and I replied something like, it, it, it means that the age of rational discourse as our central way of doing things is over. Because like, believe in science, this doesn't even make any damn sense, right? It's like, we have reached the point where science is this talisman that we like wave at things to make them go away. Um, and people just pick the science that, that they want. So, you know, in the face of something like that, when we have people being like, okay, but if we sense make harder, this will all make sense. You know, I'm just kind of like, I don't actually think so. Um, I think that, uh, I think that if, if we're not, if we're not engaging with the fact that a lot of this complexity doesn't make sense, I think if we're, if we're not engaging with the fact that there's a lot of emotional intuitive stuff that, I mean, yes, I'm sure sense making is not purely analytical mental. Someone's going to point me to something where Schmachtenberger talks about embodiment because I believe he does at times. So mm -hmm. let me just acknowledge that. Sure. Right now. But the overall frame just feels so rational analytical to me. And I just I, I just have a rebellion against that internally. Yeah. 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 That, that's what I kind of wanted to hit on um, with with uh, something we I think we mutually align on. So so. 
Yeah, I mean that's sort of the general question: are these are these circles and the framing? Is it is it too analytical? Is it too intellectual? And what would that mean? I know there's a lot of discussion about going meta or meta thinking or metacognition, which often seems to imply like a a system of systems, right? Yeah. I mean that, that's sort of the go-to. Let's organize all the different aspects of uh, of sense making into this sort of meta system to help us navigate the meta crisis right so there's yeah, this kind of yeah. categorizing of category categories to help like transition through these times right like let's meta harder and there's yeah. that one line i think i mentioned this to us uh in, in a previous like mutations call or something but it's that tim morton line anything you can do i can do meta has been the kind of mo of modernity actually to kind of go more abstract right to 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 um, to enwrap everything in more conceptualization in order to understand it better, right? Like yeah. sort of a hall of mirrors process. So so that's the kind of sense I get. On the one hand, like I sympathize and I, I know, as you're saying, they talk about embodiment and different sort mm -hmm. of modes of sense making. I, I hear them talk about it. Verveke's talking about a kind of cog sci interpretation yeah. of using psychedelics and altered states. And like, right in there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's 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 there, but then there's also something that I, I sense is isn't quite there, right? It's kind of within yeah. this framework of this sort of hyper intellectualism, um, and I think that's always kind of you know feel free to chime in as well. But I feel that 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 is that sort of prevents these communities that are attempting to move into let's say the framework of like game A to game B. Um, mm -hmm. It prevents these communities from really looking at themselves in that more poetic embodied human way or anthropological way right where maybe it would be easier to kind of get a sense of oh we're coming from a techno rationalist culture that is sort of suffused with libertarianism and certain economic ideologies and we need to disentangle ourselves from that too so, yeah. so i find that they kind of get tripped up with these very kind of i don't know my sense of going meta feels more and I, I get this from you as well, experiential, as you mentioned, yeah. participatory, embodied um, as a as a place to begin rather than yeah. a place to land. Uh, right. Or step so. along the way somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you're you're right that it is this kind of meta. There's the 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 the, the meta frame is is very intellectual, right? So yeah, they've got spirituality and embodiment and emotion in there. They're not totally ignoring that. They're not being ultra rational robot types. Um, but there is this overall frame that feels a lot more mental, mental structure type of type of stuff. Um, and you know, I've kind of lost my train of thought in there somewhere. Um, Oh yeah, I mean, just in terms of all of the meta things, it's 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 funny. After, I think it was Brandon Norgard's call that he had about like what is the inner role and all of, what is all of these things together. I can't remember if you were on that call. I think yeah, you yeah, were. I was. yeah. And I remember writing down some notes, um, you know, about that, uh, about things, and like writing down. You know, people talked about meta context and meta, you know, a lot of meta things. And I wrote down mega context and I decided what this meant was like, instead of the, instead of trying to construct this overarching, like, like, you know, Ken Wilber integral map of like, we're going to put all the developmental theories or anything that's vaguely similar to a developmental theory on one big chart and linearize it and like correlate them across. Like, instead of doing that, where you're like trying to create this meta superstructure, like just engage with all of whatever's going on in one giant scope. That would be the mega scope. I mm -hmm. haven't done anything with this mega con context idea. It just, it just, I wrote it down. And I was like, okay, I guess that's a thing. Um, and and it felt it felt better to me to think of it as like, okay, yeah, all of these things are here, and and we don't want to try to construct something over them because you get what we've talked about before, which is that. You know, with Wilbur's thing, he linearized both Gebser and Graves, neither of which are really putting out a totally linear system. But because Wilbur was correlating it with all these other linear systems, okay, well, we have to we have to stretch it out. We'll get rid of the cyclical stuff here. We'll get rid of the kind of nonlinear structural unfolding that's going on. And and it it it's limiting. 
it's limiting. And it, and again, it feels like a control structure, um, mm -hmm. uh, like a way to get a handle on things, which obviously there's a utility in that. But again, I feel like I feel like looking for control structures in a world that's as as chaotic and confusing and in in transit liminal, if we must say, <laughs> as, as we are right now, like that just doesn't feel like the right move to me on an intuitive level. It 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 feels like you're inevitably going to miss things. You're inevitably going to exclude a bunch of of important things uh, by trying to trying to fit it into something that you can, you can chart. So, right. And I love right. charts. I love yeah, them. I mean, like... I mean, they are fun. <laughs> um, and that, that's part of what attracted me to, to Wilbur and integral theory and, and, and all the rest of it initially, which, which was the, the kind of coherence and the fun of, of seeing how things are all kind of connected or system systemically connected. Um, I, I think, I think for me that the kind of lesson in that is, the sense that uh, these demarcations and delineations and how we order and systematize things can be a bridge to other, or yeah. it can be a wall, right? Wall. And, mm -hmm. Or or it can be, as you say, like a system of control in the sense of like colonizing other, you know, yeah. spending yeah. that rather than a bridge, it's sort of a destruction of the other or a subsuming of the other. And, and there's always that danger in working with those kinds of maps that we can't really ever get away from so this, this also leads me to um ironically you know joe lightfoot our, our friend um mm -hmm. who wrote that the liminal web article um yeah. he kind of placed us in the sort of systems poets meta theorists arena um mm -hmm. and i don't necessarily disagree with with that yeah. um but it does highlight or illustrate how um I feel this way, and I, and I sense that you do as well, as you describe this as well, that that we are kind of in this sort of, you know, appreciating meta theory, but also f getting that hunch that, okay, this yeah. is not really exhaustively descriptive. And in fact, actually, it's to the contrary, it might take away from our ability to understand what's present and what's going on. And so like you and I have been sort of navigating that space. And I, and I, empathize with the, with your work with trying to sort of decolonize graves yeah. work right um so maybe as a segue to this question uh, i know you've been working with nora bateson's work and doing the warm data labs and mm -hmm. i'm kind of curious how that process for you has has affected your work with graves and in work with meta theory you know i mean it's a really interesting space to kind of come in working with the meta theory and then doing the warm data labs and working with yeah. Nora's style of thinking, it really does a number on you. It, um, it, it was it was pretty fascinating and and also something that I that I very much needed, um, right? Because so I was already, you know, the 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 diagram thing that is that I'm I'm kind of using to try to build this conversational ritual. Um, approach that is another side-by-side -side experiential thing you know that had kind of that's a different way of visualizing kind of the, the cycles and patterns in graves rather than the linear progression um and that had that had emerged in summer of of uh of 2020 you know kind of at the height of the pandemic um and i've been trying to kind of work with that and you know about a year ago i realized oh i could do this sort of conversational ritual and working on that off and on. And then for various reasons, it's still kind of a, kind of an ongoing thing to figure out, but I'd already, so I'd already started, um, you know, trying to make this less linear, trying to focus on an experience and turning things into prompts. So like, that's, that's kind of a key point here. Cause remember when I was talking about the mystic midway, like, Oh, it's important that these are open questions that they're prompts mm -hmm. and, and Scott Lefkoff, the, the, the kind of visionary behind the mystic midway has some other, things that he's working on that are, that are prompt based. So I'd incorporated that into what I was trying to use Gravesian theory for. So I was already working on that and starting to share that a bit more. Um, and then Nora had her, her stage theory is, is bullshit always has been as colonial as hell. And I was like, Whoa, all right, this is a thing. So, you know, I jumped in there and I was like, but look, I've got my cool diagram. And she's like, okay, well that's better. But mm, you know, and we had some good, 
good discussions. And fortunately, she was teaching a warm data class a couple months later. So, mm -hmm. so my friend Naomi, uh, who first introduced me to Spiral Dynamics, um, and I both took the the class, which was really great. Um, uh, and it really dovetailed with what I was already trying to do, and and really nudged me to have more faith in letting the questions be open. I was getting very bogged down into like, oh my God, how do I script this whole ritual so that people understand what they need to do and don't reject it and don't get too confused and don't take it in the wrong direction, whatever that means. Um, and then warm data, it's such an open process with just the lightest touches towards what kind of like the prompts are so wide open of like what's emerging and the con and it's all about trans contextuality but the context of things like politics and science and family and you know there's these very broad concepts and you have the discussions with people and you might not necessarily obviously talk about these things during the process even though they're the things you were given but probably by the time you've had you've hit the end of your little time of with with you know that group and those those contexts then it turns out you probably did talk about that somehow um you know but but you don't go in being like all right we have to hit this point we have, did, did we hit all three of our contexts did we you know did, did we actually do we actually have a list of what's emerging you know to take back as a report like you don't do that you you just let things flow um and it was such a human experience. I mean, Naomi and I would talk about how we just like felt more optimistic about humanity after each class, you know, because we would we would do a basically a warm data or people need people is the online version, which is what we were really doing because you know pandemic. Um, so we would do a people need people during each each class, and we would just be like, yeah, wow, this is so much more connection. This is, this is so human. Um, so that was a, and, and, and Nora introduced the concept of a phonopoiesis during that class and published the paper on, on medium, you know, I think it's coming out in some conference proceedings at some point, but it's on medium right now, like either during or right after that class. So it was right when that was coming out. Um, so all of that was very much a, oh yeah, I've been, I didn't know I was looking for this. And it, it's very much giving me more confidence to just like, okay, do the prompts and see where it goes and don't try to control it so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a phonopoiesis might be a good topic to lean into if, if it's possible, right? Um, yeah. I, I'm still wrapping my head around around the article and 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 Nora's articulation of this, but, but my sense is, and it's interesting because it shares etymologically a word um, a phanis from Greek with diaphony, which is important right. for Gepser's work as well. So my my curiosity was immediately piqued and just sort of interested in that sort of is there an intersection here? But um, but yeah, like a a phanis, right? And then poesis and sort of creating, right? So so it's sort of like this relationship between the visible and invisible, and, and maybe you yeah. can help. Yeah. That. So yeah, I mean, I definitely recommend reading the whole paper because it's great but it's you know it's also dense and long and <laughs> medium's like 44 minute read i'm like oh that might be the longest medium article i've seen <laughs> uh and um so so yeah i mean it, it is about the unseen coalescing towards vitality i think is yeah. the is, is, is the, the one liner there but but what does that mean right and and noir talks about insidious processes being a thing where um, you're not necessarily noticing it, but things are slowly getting worse and worse and you might have some horrible effects emerge. And she asked the question of like, well, what's the opposite of that? Like, what's the word for, for positive things that you might not be noticing that might coalesce and eventually emerge in, in some way? Um, and she coined a phonopoiesis for that uh, because it is that unseen creative coalescing um, process that's happening. And it's not necessarily that you can't see the processes at all, but it's it's you're not likely to, and it's hard to come at directly. Mm -hmm. um, and and for me, it's been very interesting because I mean, again, I I started writing out what hell of metamodernism was as a joke on a Facebook post, um, and then started kind of being like, okay, well, I need to figure out what's going on. And I came up up with ambiguity. 
because ambiguity, it, it lets you preserve a lot of options. So, so when you're doing things that are ambiguous, you can react to how people react to them and, and keep going. Um, uh, and indirection, um, so not coming at things directly. So whether that's the side-by-side -side experience, like we talked about in the Mystic Midway, or also the conversational ritual involves people sharing based on prompts again without without debating them, but but witnessing each other without having to without having the burden of responding or being responsible for what the other person said. Um, so that's indirection there, and 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 I realized. You know, going back and reading the whole paper top to bottom, um, as opposed to just having heard about it in class and like skimmed it, it's like, oh, this actually underpins a lot of those ideas. Like, ah, which itself is kind of an afana poetic process of emergence, right? Like, I had all these ideas from the Mystic Midway and from, from you know, reading about my the the scene that I'm part of in this book and from. Nora Bateson's warm data class, and those all kind of came together and coalesced. And then I realized, oh, this is this is emerging as this thing that I named Hella Metamodernism. And that is a coalescence toward vitality of these things. And now as I as I listen to what I've figured out subconsciously, then I'm discovering these things. Like remember, I said that I felt like I'm discovering this more than I am constructing it. Um, right. So in that sense, it is an afonopoetic process itself. Um, these things have come together. I didn't set out to create a new school of metamodernism. Um, you know, maybe like that, that, I, that had sort of popped up as an idea in my head kind of in the background, but it wasn't like something I was doing as a project. Um, but if I tried to set that up, right, and this is to kind of show the difference between like what's afonopoiesis and what's not afonopoiesis, Right. If I had a year ago said, all right, I know enough metamodernism, I should come up with my own metamodernism. Let me, you know, I would have gone and analyzed Hansi's work and 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 the notes on metamodernism paper and and other things and been like, okay, I want this and I want this and I'm going to build this thing. And I probably would have kept more developmental theory because I know that stuff. And, and I would have constructed something and it might have been interesting, but it probably wouldn't have been what's emerging now um because i would have been making choices and what those choices often do is they limit the complexity and Noir talks about this a lot in the paper is is what we're trying to do is to preserve the complexity and preserve the options that the complexity can emerge in different ways mm -hmm. and that's that's super powerful and and i feel like when we talk about ex experience and shared experience um Right. You know, if you have people wandering through the Mystic Midway, encountering characters, prompting them to do various things where they have the option to respond to that however they want, including turning around and just noping the fuck out of there, which occasionally somebody does. <laughs> and someone be like, I'm allergic to I, I'm 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 afraid of skeletons and clowns. And like, here I am in Mr. Nobody with the skull head and the clown. And I'm like, OK, we're going over here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, like we kind of peeked our head. I was like, is he okay? Oh, okay, he's with his friends. All right, fine. Um, you know, hopefully he had some other good experiences other than that. And, uh, but, you know, people are wandering around and they're having these conversations and, and, you know, maybe they plan on doing this, but since we're often at other people's events, maybe probably not um, if they didn't know we were going to be there. Uh, and that might produce things in them and and that might impact how they look at the world because oh they they were asked about something they didn't realize how much they needed to share um yeah. so i'm kind of rambling here but but like the idea is to is to look at these things that openly openly engage with whatever's actually present versus things that try to construct and assess and assert um so like if i had asserted what the California School of Metamodernism was, um, I would have closed down some things that might come up. Maybe I would have figured it out eventually. Like maybe that would have reemerged later. It's possible. Um, but you can definitely find situations where it's not. And if you go and you try to tell somebody like, okay, well, you should look in this direction, that's gonna shut them down. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna recover from that, at least not in the context where you are. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like it's a tremendously important concept, um, uh, this idea that we have this ongoing complexity that's not entirely seen and that 
that um, you can't you can't just go up and do something about it. You can't go, oh, I'm going to do the afanopoiesis now. Like that <laughs> it doesn't even make any sense, right? It's it's all about you 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 did a thing and it's submerged into what into the the stream of what's going on within you within society within mm, whatever mm-hmm. living system we're talking about and maybe that's going to emerge somewhere at some point maybe not for a long time you don't know you don't try to control that um, yeah 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 that's um there's a lot of interconnections with with some of the themes that i think were implicit in in Nora's work uh previously but just a like a a wonderful expression of something and and it's sort of an again an illustration of sort of being in between um the 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 systems theorist right the meta theorist and then the systems poet in the sense of it's giving a name to a process which extends beyond the name or the category's capacity to capture or yeah. even point to and say, oh, the map is not the territory, but here's the whole map. Here's like everything that's going on. But remember, the map's not the territory. It's not even saying that. It's kind of this, like you're saying, it's almost like a translucent, um, a gentle little word that just is, is it's there and it's kind of um, um, redirecting attention to what's present, right? With, with maybe some idea that, hey, there's an outside that you'll never totally grok or capture. Yeah. And it's, you're, you're part of it, you contribute to it. And there's processes which contribute to emergence, poesis, cultural evolution, if we want to call it that, yeah. right? But they're not something that we can totalize in our maps. Um, right. So, so there's a different relationship, I think, with map making that Afana is sort of illustrating, and I and I feel yeah. for me as well, Nora's work is is really hitting on this this um, very interesting middle point between just being in this and then um, allowing thinking, allowing categories to have a smaller place in relationship with that like living complexity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, there's a there is a point in the paper where she's like, this is this is not about new age surrender to everything. <laughs> I don't remember exactly how she said it, but that's that's how it landed to me. Like, it's it's not about just just surrender and don't don't do anything at all. Just like, you know, detach from the world. It's not that. Um, but it's also not go in and do the stuff. Right. So. So, yeah, it's I mean, I've I've. This may or may not be a phrase in the paper, quite likely. But, um, I've come to think of it more as tending to the complexity. Mm. Like you're you're tending to something that has its own its own direction and its own nature, and you're you are trying to, you know, in order to, to engage with this concept of phenopoiesis and like just just as a caveat, like I I I do not speak for Nora here. I might be getting some direction wrong here and there, but but my impression here is like to to engage with this concept. Like you want to tend to this complexity and respect it, and there's a lot of listening to what's going on, and and you know, carefully doing things that seem like they are welcome, um, and and accepting that you might not know what's going to happen. So you're going to be doing more listening again, and you're going to continue to tend to that. Um, and that that right now is the phrase that that sticks in my head of 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 how you in, how you engage with or make use of the idea of a phonopoiesis. because again you can't just go in and do it and this this comes up in the turn your life into art book too where he's talking about psychomagic in the Yodorovsky sense of of like when you're trying to build an experiential art experience you can't you can't have a set of steps that like this happens and that happens and that happens and then they have a cool experience and there's magic and they're like woo it's like no it doesn't it doesn't do that if you like you can have some steps that you do but like it has to be really flexible and you have to react to what's going on and like mostly you're just trying to create the conditions where someone might have an have a magical experience of some sort right yeah. like if I'm playing Mr. Nobody, the fear eater, and I ask people for fears, like some people are gonna, a lot of people are gonna say spiders. And a lot of them are going to say spiders because spiders is, an, is a socially acceptable thing to be afraid of. Some people say spiders because they're really afraid of them. And you can usually tell the difference between whether it's a real fear or whether they're just like, uh, spiders, I'm gonna go now. 
Because some people are like, you say, they say that and you're like, yeah, that is, you are, that is your fear. I'm, let me consume that for you. And of course I always consume it because I might be misjudging it. I'm there to channel their fear, whether, whatever I think of it, Mr. Nobody's there to eat their fear. That's what's really happening. Um, but, uh, shoot, I totally lost track of what I'm, was doing. Oh, I, I was just th throwing, throwing the ball at you with, um, the sense of, of, uh, a phanopoiesis being, um, oh, well, I really appreciated your point about tending to, yeah, uh, reality, tending to oh. complexity. It was conditions of, of magic, right? So like mm -hmm. Mr. Nobody being there with the prompt of I'll eat your fear, some people will send something pretty shallow to it. And and again, you know, I don't want to disrespect anyone because I, the human, might be misinterpreting that. So of course I, I treat it seriously and do the yeah. do the eating ritual. Um, but some people will hear that invitation and it will trigger something very deep in them and they will share something very important to them that they they needed to get out more than they realized. And that is psychomagic. And that is an experience that happened. And you created the conditions for that, knowing full well that it won't happen for everyone. Mm. And that's fine. Um, but here's the thing. And this might be the magical experience for someone. Someone else might have a magical experience with some other character. Someone else might not really get anything from it at all. And that's OK. And you, you, you have to you have to accept that these things that you put into the stream of complexity of, of living people, cultures, whatever may or may not trigger whatever it is you're hoping to trigger. Um, and, and you accept that and, and you listen. And if you, if you're going to keep doing things, you, you come back to be like, all right, well, I'll, I'll try to facilitate the next set of conditions that I think might help. Um, but again, it may or may not, and we're not trying to force that to help. If it doesn't, then listen to what that is. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it's because the person's afraid of skeletons and you're wearing a giant skull. Okay, that that's, that person requires different conditions. Let's <laughs> let's accept that and go with it. Um, and and I think we can we can actually kind of loop this back into the sense making if you want to do that. Or if you had something else you wanted to ask, let's let's. No, please do. Yeah, please. Do, I, yeah, do I mean, I, I, because I, I feel like, like with the sense making, it is a little bit more of, of I'm going to try to make sense of that. So first of all, the language makes sense. You're already you're already pushing and imposing on that, mm -hmm. right? I, there's a thing that doesn't make sense. I'm going to change. I'm going to make sense over it. Um, and that is very different from facilitating potential magic, right? Like it's kind of the difference between going in and being like, all right, what are your fears? Oh, you don't know? Okay, well, what about in this direction? Well, what about in that direction? It's like, <laughs> can you run our, que our questionnaire and like, okay, oh yeah, you really do, you really are afraid of spiders. All right, let's do a ritual and I'll eat the spiders. Okay, <laughs> like, now it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, all right, now you're, you're out of the magic by then. Like the magic is gone. Any magic that might have been there is not there. You're just like, oh my god, I just filled out a questionnaire. What what am I doing? I don't. That's rarely a magical experience for people. I'm I'm sure we can come up with an example, but um. yeah, yeah. What's what's so interesting about this? I'm just sort of drawing a connection with um something from so so part of my work right now. I'm, I'm working on the the new book, and uh, a lot of it has to do with like how do we imagine social transformation or these sort of meta constructive histories about how we're evolving or can we rework those maps that so that they aren't really like that but they're attempting to be more descriptive and relational yeah. with like with complexity and try to respect and as you say tend to i really appreciate that that phrasing because it, it, there's an image of um more of the kind of um you know what they call um uh, traditional ecological knowledge tech uh, sort of like indigenous practices of like land custodial ship that Tyson Young mm -hmm. Porter talks about as well, that there's a tending to living things, right? So ideas become in service to aliveness rather than yeah. something that you go in and, and, and you impose something static upon that living dynamic system, but actually ideas can work with aliveness right. if they're the appropriate size or the appropriate, um, application that's not too imposing on on things, right? So I, I find that to be a very interesting and also difficult 
and tricky uh, balance. Um, but I was thinking of Ursula K. Le Guin's essay, uh, California as a non-Euclidean or a very cold place to be. I always mess up the title, but it's this beautiful long essay basically saying, you know, utopia and the sense of progress and history has always been this march forward, right? Imposing yeah. ourselves upon reshaping tomorrow, building it with that sort of Apollonic or Zeus-like masculine approach, right? Yeah. And her suggest suggestion is that we do a utopian rather than a utopiang, just a sort of a playful mm. reversal or sub, you know. Yeah. And the way she describes it is be very indirect. There's no way directly to progress or the future. You have to be indirect. You have to be hidden. You have to be dark. You have all the things that Yin is associated with. And in yeah. some ways, I'm hearing echoes of that in, in the way you're talking about and Nora is talking about a fan of Poesis and, and the warm data approach. So, yeah. so maybe, you know, in our kind of meandering conversation, equally perhaps Yin in that sense, like there, there's an indirect way we're answering that question about, you know, what are those tensions between a lot of the sense makers and meta theorists and what we're feeling into that is missing. That's not yeah. merely the kind of poetic, dressing on 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 the meal or the plate or you know like mm -hmm. um the way an essay has a poem at the beginning of it you know just as a mm -hmm. kind of adornment we're not saying that you know there's something more integral to this approach to thinking yeah. in general and, and being in the world in general that it, that that might be kind of missing in this whole equation so yeah yeah and then i think i think it all comes back to to the experiential approach, right? So in, instead of looking at the, the external thing where we're we're either extracting from, extracting sense from, or imposing sense on, right? We want to experience and participate something, which may or may not make sense. I mean, the Mystic Midway is a bunch of people in magical weird costumes prompting you for stuff like I, I'm not sure how in an analytical way that makes sense in like. The first time Scott told me about it, I was like, okay, is this really gonna work? I'll trust you because I know you've done some cool stuff. And I got it. And I'm like, oh, actually, yeah, this totally works. This totally, I have no idea. And I was just, that was when I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta pay attention to what's going on here. And I have to get deeper into this. Um, uh, and, and experiencing things together, right? Like in terms of affecting cultural change, I think rather than going at like, I don't know, anti-racism or something. I mean, not to dismiss the importance of that is very important, but, but like, if you've got, if you've got people butting heads against that, if you can step aside from that for a while, have an experience together that may not have anything obviously to do with race or racism or anti-racism or any of, of that sort of thing, but have some sort of significant experience together, whatever that is. Um, and I want to, I want to touch a little bit on, on, TikTok and and what I'm thinking of as, as experiential memes. Um, uh, but if you can have some sort of experience together, then like, okay, now you've built a bit of a connection. Mm -hmm. And so now you've put something into that stream where you may have insidious or a fun of poetic processes, but you put something in that's hopefully more conducive to a fun of poetic process. And maybe eventually when that person comes around and, and encounters anti-racism ideas, they might think, I mean, maybe it's as simple as like, well, that last person that I kind of disagree with about this wasn't a total asshole. So maybe I'll give it a little more thought. It could be that simple. Um, maybe it's, maybe there needs to be a lot more, but, but, you know, finding some way to connect through experience. Um, I mean, we don't ask people's politics when they show up as guests in a Mystic Midway show. And like in San Francisco, they're probably the well, we've done shows somewhere. We did a big show in Vegas once and uh, at, a, at a festival there. And, and, you know, there were tourists who were from who knows where. So it's like, um, you know, that, that stuff doesn't have anything to do with whether you can have a magical experience with these mm -hmm. characters in this environment. Um, and, and just, it gets a little bit back to if we want to look at the at the developmental theory at like Gravesian theory, it gets back to tending to those very early, early stages that are so important. Um, you know, of, of basically your 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 very basic physical intuitive sense of safety and survival 
and then your your fundamental cultural stories that are your shared way of looking at the world right those are the first those are essentially the first two stages in 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 my view so beige and purple in in standard spiral dynamics colors um and and it it it's like it's 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 kind of a you know, reemphasizing and rehydrating that layer of our experience. Mm -hmm. um, and this is how I like using developmental theory now. It's more like, oh, okay, well, here's kind of an area where we can concentrate on rather than being like, are you 50% purple and 30% red? And I, I don't know, whatever. Uh, that's not even actually how it works. They're not, they don't add up to 100%. They overlap and all this stuff. So um, it's, it's actually a very complex theory. But um, yeah, so it's it's like shoring up those those more those those kind of deeper intuitive subconscious levels, as opposed to trying to rationally argue down your disagreement, which mm -hmm. would fit up at at like the orange, um, you know, much more mental modernist rational layer, um, and and you need those discussions too. But we're not doing great at having those discussions right now. I think that's fairly no. safe to say. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly we, we're missing some prerequisites to even get to that part. And, and, I, and I think that's where we need to be, be focusing on. So that kind of inverts the sense making a bit and says, let's have experiences. Let's not worry about solving what's right in front of us. Let's, let's go off and do some stuff and, yeah. and see if we feel more human together after that. Um, and maybe that starts to create some space where eventually we can come back and engage with what was in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to create that space, right? Yeah, you do. And, and that's sort of the, um, I think the challenge with so much of this work, uh, that there's, there's a desire to, to go at directly the meta crisis, like direct applications. How do we scale the solutions? Right. Um, can I map it? <laughs> yeah, let's let's map all of the possibilities and and therefore coordinate all of those factors, yeah. and then use that coordinated meta system to tackle directly the meta crisis. Or yeah. maybe there's room for indirectness, but it's sort of like it, it's it's a sort of I don't know. Um, but it's also been slightly map somewhere. Yeah, 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 <laughs> it, yeah. Exactly. It's it, supported it, it's, map. It's somewhere in the map. It's acknowledged. Yeah. There's like some some um, acknowledgement toward it, or like a symbolic, you know, um, hat tip towards mm -hmm. the yin approaches or the indirect approaches, but not as much of a direct, yeah, hat tip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for folks who are just listening, you, you literally picked up the what is it, the fail hat, and, and yeah, that was the, the Goblin Rewards failures hat. And, yeah, and failures hat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So there's a lot of that, right? Um, but but there's there's a again, and you mentioned systems of control. I find it interesting that there's not a a willingness to actually give up the wheel, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, okay, that there's a place for that in this machine of that we're designing for the future, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get to drive, right? Like it, yeah. it gets the back seat or it gets the trunk or it gets some right. kind of like bumper sticker, but it's not going to drive things into the future. Um, and we're kind of I mean, we're, what we're asking for, it seems like, um, is, is a fairly big ask, which is yeah. let go of the wheel <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> and let's not go down the road. Actually, let's turn off the road for a bit. Yeah. Um, and how do we get how do we get to the future roundabout or sideways? Right. Or like uh, like we've been talking about in the mutations community, like Gepser's phrase of like back leaps into the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know, what does that look like and how does that feed in a very indirect um, hidden, uh, a phonopoesis sort of way, how does that lead to the emergence of second tier, integral consciousness, whatever you want to call it, planetary culture? Because yeah. like you're saying, it seems to me, the only way forward is really this indirect way, like of actually yeah. kind of meeting and connecting with each other again. And, yeah. and that seems to be part of the problem too. It's like, we're so decontextualized. We're so in the head all the time that- yeah like it's a fairly radical move to kind of just go in reverse or go sideways yeah. or to stop. Yeah. Um, so there's something in there. That's yeah. And um, what was I going to say? 
in 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 Benjamin, I mean caveat caveat magister is the, the pen name there. Uh, in, in in caveat's book, um, yeah. Oh no, I lost lost what I was gonna say. So we were talking about the the leap back to the future. We we're talking about um, kind of the the connection. Now I've totally forgotten what I was gonna say. Hmm. Back into the invisible then. <laughs> um, the invisible. Oh, oh. Hmm. Yeah, I mean it, it is it is all about. I'm just coming back to the experiential thing. I, I had something and I've lost it. Sorry. <laughs> it's it's all good. I I, I just uh, I'm beginning to appreciate the sense of um ironically coherence like between um what you've been working on and, and how you've been describing your journey on, on your website, which I'll, I'll mm -hmm. link to you in the show notes. Um, uh, the great stage debate, which really brought all this up with Nora a few months back yeah. and, and now like kind of moving into, interestingly, I feel like there's been a shift at least in our, in our area of the liminal web of mm -hmm. articulating something that's complementary or something that is, um, difficult to voice, but is has been sort of missing from the territory for a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I find this sort of constructive, upon a, a, a poetic. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we would say it exactly, describe it using that word, but this constructive emergent process of like articulating a different sort of integrality or big picture thinking or different ways to go meta seem to be. Um, having more voice, right? Uh, and having more coherence in terms of like, I get what you're saying, get what Nora's saying. I feel yeah. like there's a connection with like what Le Guin was writing about in mm -hmm. decades ago now. Yeah. I, re I remember what it was. Um, so yeah, in the book, Caveat talks about for creating these psychomagical experiences, because that, that is what the book is about. It's not just a history of what's gone on here. There's plenty of stories told, but it's about like, how can you create these yourself? If you want to do these, how can you have these experiences? How can you facilitate these experiences? And he talks a lot about kind of nudging people out of their regular experience of the world. Right. And like with the Mystic Midway, we do this through the characters and the costumes and the sets. And like you walk into the space and like, obviously, there's something a little odd going on here. It's like you don't you don't have a script for this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, and he talks about another thing where like uh, some people went out onto the streets in, in San Francisco and like there was like a protest or a, or a rally or something, but like they're wearing a sandwich board, but it was blank and they were handing out blank flyers. And I can't remember what else was going on in there, but like you ran into this thing and you're like, okay, I know what's doing, but there's nothing on here. Wait, what am I, what am I supposed to do with the blank flyer? Oh, okay. Well now you're nudged out of your daily routine. And if you proceed through this zone where other things are happening, you might experience them differently than if you just, you know, if you came upon them directly, right? So you use some technique of a surprising thing or or unusual costuming or setting or something else like that. And nudging people a little bit out of where they are is a way to then prime them to maybe connect in a way that they didn't expect to connect, mm -hmm. right? Because now they're not on, they're, they're off script. They don't know what they're doing necessarily you want to keep it on script enough that they are you know of not running away entirely you know in fear but but you want to yeah you want to nudge it out and that that helps rebuild something and i think that's part of that indirect process of of like yeah we're trying to build connections um so rather than going in and be like all right i'm gonna wire you to here and I'm like that it's like all right I'm, at first i'm gonna i'm gonna as consensually as possible, nudge you to be a little bit, a little bit in a liminal moment here. And let's see what happens now. Like before yeah. you kind of resolve back into the rest of your day, what, what can, what can we do together here? Mm -hmm. What can we as performers and, and you and you and you as, as, as guests intentional or otherwise have right here in this moment. And how can that, you know, do a little bit more weaving of of connection that might then sustain actual change in the future, eventually. Yeah, yeah. Well said. I know we're coming up at the over the hour mark here, so mm -hmm. so I'll just ask 
Uh, Henry, where where can folks find you and connect with you? Where's your website? Where, where, right. where do they plug in online? Uh, yeah, so my website is apophany-epiphany.com. Um, I assume we'll put that in a in a put a link on there somewhere instead of trying to to spell it out. Apophany, by the way, is like an apophany is is a is a false realization. So like an epiphany is a true realization. An apophany is you saw patterns and you thought they were meaningful and actually they're not. You just totally came up with that. So so the the thing when I was making that with all the diagram stuff, I'm like, am I am I seeing real patterns in this diagram or am I totally making this up? Um, uh, I have also registered hellametamodernism.com uh, and .org, so I might add a site there at some point, but I haven't done anything with that yet. Uh, but yeah, that's my site. You can sign up either for your paid, and um, uh, there's plenty of, of free content there. And I will be putting out a major article on hellametamodernism in the near future. It's, it's coming along. Um, there's a preview article up there for paid uh, subscribers right now. Um, Excellent. but, uh, but yeah, the full one's coming out soon. And my friend Naomi most, who I mentioned before, who got me into spiral dynamics, um, she's co-hosted one or two of the future fossil fossils podcasts with, with Michael. Um, she's working on a hella modernism manifesto. So she'll, she's working on the short form and I'm working on the long form. So we'll have that. All right. Point. We're going to have to have you both on mutations to talk about that. Once it's all coming together, that sounds really exciting. Uh, I think um, it will be. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Henry. Thanks for joining us on Mutations. And uh, I'm sure we'll have you again back soon uh, to talk more about this, because I feel like there's just so much more we can unpack, um, especially about this latter part and what this all means as a, as a little bookmark for the future, what yeah. this all means, right? And I'll, I'm very excited to see how um, the Hella Metamodern essay um, unpacks this and unfolds, but what this all means yeah. for meta theory, right? How does, how do yeah. these experiential practices, relational practices, um, change the way we can think about meta theoretical concepts and social transformation and yeah. Et cetera, so. And, and the potential, just one, one thing to throw in just to, for, as a, again, another future bookmark, the potential with TikTok for experiential means, right? Because yes. With things like TikTok challenges and duets, people are doing things in response to a viral idea. It's not just, oh, here's my cute cat picture with a caption, and I'm going to share that, which, I mean, cool, that's a, that's a lot of information that goes around this little image. But, like, now you can actually set something out and, and encourage people to do that with you, in a sense. And it's like, oh, wow, that's so, so powerful. Yeah. Um, and I'm practically TikTok illiterate still, but I'm very excited about the potential of that medium to like actually start putting experiences out in a way that people can join in somehow and yeah. reflect back. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's definitely talk about those, <laughs> just those two things, right? That's at least two more conversations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Henry, but it was a, uh, it was a pleasure and uh, we'll talk again soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was wonderful. Awesome. Thanks.